Almighty God, we thank you so much for this time, this chance to be in your house, to hear your word, to worship. And Lord, we pray, just like we had this week where you moved in the lives of children in our VBS, Lord, we pray that you would move in our lives this morning. Lord, change us from the inside out so that when we leave this building today, we would be different and we would look and think more like you. So Lord, touch our lives, touch our hearts, touch our minds, uh, that we can be changed and transformed to look more like your son, Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things in his name, the name of our Savior and our Lord, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're going to go ahead and take a seat. So it was big, it was ugly, it was loud and obnoxious, it was manly. I'm not talking about an ex-girlfriend, I'm talking about (laughs) my first vehicle. I turned 16 years old and my parents helped me get a 1974 GMC pickup truck, oversized wheels, a 454 cubic inch inch engine, 4.7 liters engine. If you're not familiar with cars, in 1974, this was the engine that came out of the Corvette that pushed out almost 400 horsepower, and they put it in a pickup truck. It was loud, it was powerful, it was everything that a Texas teenager wanted in their first vehicle. And it was mine. I say it was ugly because it was hideously ugly. It was painted lime green on the outside. And I don't know if you remember the 1974 Chevy and GMC pickups. They had that that white panel that went down the middle. So it was lime green on the top, white, and then lime green on the bottom. It was ugly. The interior was called avocado green. It looked like you had fed an infant like peas that had turned bad, and he threw up all over the dashboard. That's what it looked like in the interior. The seats were so bad that it had one of those polyester, it was a bench seat, and it had one of those polyester seat covers, the kind that uh, if you sat on it with bare skin, you'd get a rash from it. That was the inside. I mean, it was bad. The speaker system was so awful that the guy who owned it before me had taken house speakers out of a home entertainment system and just thrown them in the back seat and run the wiring through the ceiling and hot-wired it into the sound system in the, in the truck. I mean, it was bad. It was awful, and it was awesome all at the same time. I mean, I went places and did things in that truck that my parents had strictly forbidden I'm not going to go into details because there are teenagers in the room right now, and I don't want to give them any ideas, but it was amazing. <laughs> like Dukes of Hazard kind of stuff. I mean, it was awesome. But I owned this truck for about three weeks, and my dad and I noticed that it was making a rumbling sound that even for a 454 cubic inch engine was not quite right. And so my dad and I crawled under the truck and realized that the muffler's Well, there was rust where the mufflers should have been, but the mufflers were pretty much gone at this point, and so we took it down to an auto mechanic, said, hey, what can you do? And he gave us some options, and me, being a Texas teenager, put 30-inch glass packs on it. For those of you who are vehicle guys, a glass pack is the opposite of a muffler. A muffler is designed to actually do exactly that, muffle the sound. It's supposed to take the engine sound and quiet it down a little bit. A glass pack is lined with fiberglass and actually makes the engine sound louder. And so I had a 454, which is a huge engine, and then I put 30-inch glass packs on it. So you could hear me coming from five miles away (laughs) in this truck. Like, I would turn it on, and I'd get phone calls from my friends across town saying, I know you're coming to school right now, so I'll meet you there because I can hear you coming. So this thing was obnoxious, and it was amazing. It was a perfect truck for a Texas teenager. And about three weeks after putting the glass packs on, uh, I'm driving down the street, and I heard a rattling sound from under the truck. 
And over the day, as the day progressed, the rattling sound got worse and it got worse and it got worse until finally at the end of the day, I got home and the rattling was so intense, this metal on metal sound and it was fast and it was obnoxious. It sounded like my truck was a ticking time bomb. And so my dad and I crawled under the truck to see what it was and we realized that when they put the glass packs in, the part of the pipe that bends over the axle, the axle is the pipe that holds the tires onto the vehicle, where it bends over the axle, they had not installed it correctly and the pipe was bent over a little bit and it was rattling against the frame of my truck as I drove down the road. Now, I was a teenager, so I drove crazy. So the rattling got worse and worse and worse. And as a Texas teenager, I did what every good Texas guy does. I got some bailing wire out. I took some bailing wire and I wrapped it around the muffler and then I ran that bailing wire to the other side of the truck and pulled it tight and wrapped it against the frame. That truck never rattled again. It was awesome. It was the perfect southern engineering that anyone could do. Because let's face it, if I drove that truck without repairing that pipe, man, that would be a bad situation. You're driving down the road and you hear a truck that's rattling that badly, that's embarrassing, it's annoying, it's, it's bad. Not only that, it would have eventually destroyed this new muffler that I'd put on my pickup. And so Paul talks about the same thing here in Philippians 2 today. Take your Bibles, turn to Philippians 2, starting in verse 14. Now, he doesn't talk about 74 GMC pickups, but he talks about an annoying sound that we make sometimes. Now, let me tell you about Paul, first off. While, while you're turning to Philippians 2.14, Paul is a superhero in my book. This guy's amazing. He was brought up in a home where he was living in privilege. He, he was an Israelite but had Roman citizenship, which was very rare. He probably, his family probably had money. And he started a career as a uh, Pharisee, and he was working his way up up the ladder. And he was the next up and coming guy in this Pharisee circles. Uh, when people talked about who was going to be the next big leader, Paul's name always came up. He started persecuting Christians and then Jesus got a hold of his life and ruined all of it. Jesus took his life and flipped it on its head and basically said, you're not going to be a Pharisee. You're not going to persecute my people anymore. Instead, you're going to live a hard life. You're going to go from town to town and tell people about me. You're going to be running from the government constantly. You're going to be imprisoned. You're going to be beaten. Guys, he was stoned one time outside of a city so badly that the people who were stoning him were totally convinced that he was dead, left him, Walked back in the city, and a couple hours later, a couple of guys came up, and he was alive. Stood up, shook it off, and walked out of the city. He survived a shipwreck that he prophesied was going to happen. The guy was amazing. All the time he's doing this, he wrote at least 13 of our New Testament books. Isn't that amazing? This guy knew hardship. This guy knew what it was like to have wealth and be comfortable and live the good life and then have all that flipped on its head and have all that taken away and start living a really difficult life. And that's what he talks about here this morning in Philippians 2, uh, verses 14 through 18. So let's read it. Starting in verse 14, he says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning. Oh, man. <laughs> That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of lights, uh, life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. So what is Paul's command here? Paul's command is don't complain. Don't grumble. Don't question. Stop complaining. Now, parents, how many of you would love for your children to pay attention to this passage? How many of you have children that complain? Yeah? Children do that. But where do you think they learn it? Oh! Man, just drop kicked you. You're welcome. 
we all complain, don't we? It's part of our human nature. And Paul is here saying, don't complain. Oh, man, that's not easy. That's hard. And so let's look at this for a second. Why shouldn't we complain? Well, first off, complaining is corrosive. Complaining is corrosive. And let's look at a few ways that it's corrosive. First off, complaining is corrosive because it's negative. Now, does Christ call us to be downers or uppers? He calls us to be uppers. He calls us, according to James chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians 5, and many other passages, he calls us to be joyful and thankful in every situation that we find ourselves in, good or bad. And so we're called not to complain because it's negative. The second way that it's corrosive is not only is it negative, but it negatively impacts the people around us. If you're around someone who is constantly complaining and that's all they do, when you get around that person, do you feel encouraged and lifted up? No, you feel the opposite. You feel down and distraught and hurt. And whew, I'm tired emotionally and physically and mentally from being around this person. So it's negative, but it also negatively affects the people that we're around. Complaining is corrosive also because it's unattractive. Think about it for a second. Why would anybody in their right mind want to accept a Savior of someone who does nothing but complain and whine and moan? Why would anybody be attracted to that? And so we, as followers of Christ, shouldn't be complaining because it's not attractive to unbelievers. It actually pushes them away from Christ. So it's negative. It negatively impacts others. It's unattractive. Complaining is corrosive because it makes us the victim. Where should the attention of our lives be focused? Up there. With him. To him. Through him. Yet when we complain, where do we point the finger? Look at me. Look at how hard my life is. Look at me. It puts the focus on the wrong place because it makes us a victim. And it takes hope out of our situation. When we constantly complain, are we saying that there's hope in Christ? No, we're saying, I'm complaining. Look at me. Look how hard my life is. Look how hard my situation is. There's no hope. But as a follower of Christ, aren't we supposed to live in faith and hope continually? So it's corrosive in that way. It's also corrosive because it downplays the positive effects of difficulties. James chapter 1, go read that chapter. It talks about over and over throughout the chapter how God puts us through difficulties to make us stronger and to grow us and to mature us. When you were in high school or college, would you have studied and learned your, your classes if you never had to take a test? No. Why would I have learned algebra if there was never a test? Why would I have learned English grammar if there was never a test? But the test makes us grow. The test makes us stronger. The test matures us. And when we complain about the test, about the difficulty, about the hard times, we downplay those positive effects. It's also corrosive because it doesn't show our faith in Christ, it shows our lack of faith in Christ, doesn't it? When we complain about our situation, we suddenly take the focus off of Christ and our faith in him, and we start talking about whether we do it consciously or subconsciously, we start pointing to the fact that we don't have faith for him to take care of our situation. But we should trust him and his promises. And let me give you a few of those promises. If you need some hope today, if you need some encouragement because of a difficult time, get your pen out right now and get ready to write down some passages. I'm going to give you several that tell us just how hopeful we can live through Christ. Here's the first one. Romans 8. He will... Uh, all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Everything that we go through is for our own good. And it's going to work out for our own good, according to Romans 8. James chapter 1. Those who remain strong in him will be rewarded. Psalm 55. 
says that God will take care of us no matter what. No matter what we're going through, no matter how difficult our situation is, Psalm 55 says that he will care for us. Matthew chapter 11 says that he will give us rest. His yoke is light and his burden is easy. You can find rest according to Matthew 11 through him. Philippians chapter four says that he will give us peace and comfort in difficult times. Philippians 4. Hebrews 13 says that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says that he will rescue us. But then it all culminates with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 towards the end. It says not only will he rescue us, but he will give us victory. And isn't that amazing? And think about the progression here for a second. He's going to work things, all things out for our good. And then he's going to give us a reward if we push through those trials. He's going to walk with us and take care of us. He's going to give us rest and peace and comfort. He's never going to leave us and he's never going to forsake us. And he's going to see us through to the end. He's going to rescue us and he's going to give us victory. Why would we complain? We have the best promises ever given to anybody who has ever lived. Why would we complain if we love that Savior and we live in those promises? So stop complaining and live in the faith that he provides. But you say, but if I don't complain, how will I bring change? Let me make it very clear. There is a very distinct difference between constructive criticism and complaining. You see, criticism affects, but complaining infects. Criticism affects. In other words, it brings change. Complaining infects, and infection is not good. You see, complaining is never the proper response because it never positively affects the situation. When all we do is whine and complain, it's like a rattling muffler on a 74 GMC pickup. It's ugly, it's annoying, it's loud, and nobody wants to be around it. So complaining infects everything around us. It destroys us and those who are around us. It hurts us, it holds us back. You see, constructive criticism and action are the ways that we're called to respond. If you've got a difficulty in your life, be looking for the positive and see how you can make that situation change. Money's tight? Okay, where do you need to make cuts in your budget? What luxuries or uh, flexible wants can you eliminate from your budget for a time in order to get your money back to where it needs to be? Maybe you need to take on more hours or take a part-time job. You say, well, my my significant other is treating me bad or my boss is really horrible to me. Okay, what do you need to do to affect that change? What have you done that has caused them to treat you badly? And how can you fix it? Guys, it's all about taking action and offering constructive criticism to make change happen rather than complaining. Because complaining does not bring change. It's just negative complaining. In high school, I uh, worked in a grocery store, and uh, if we ever had a squeaky cart, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been to the supermarket or Walmart, you you go grab that cart that's sitting off to the side, it's not in the row with all the other carts, and you grab it because it's convenient, and you turn it around and it starts making the noise, you go, oh, no, 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 not taking that cart, and you go grab another one because that one is so annoying, you would never in a million years walk through an entire store with that cart. Well, if we had one of those carts, we set it aside, and we had a guy that came once a month, and he would re-grease the wheels and try and get it up and run where it wasn't squeaking again, and he would mark the wheel, and if he had to come back a month or two later, and that same wheel was squeaking again, that cart got put in a bone pile in the back of the store and was not used. And about once a year, he would come and collect all those carts and put them in a trailer, take them back to his shop, and rather than just greasing the wheel, he would fix the wheel from the inside. 
Because if you grease the wheel and it keeps squeaking, that means there's something wrong inside of it. So he would either replace the wheel altogether or he'd take it apart and put new bearings in or whatever. He would fix it from the inside. And guys, when we squeak, Jesus does the same thing with us. You see, Jesus does not grease a squeaky wheel. He fixes it from the inside. He doesn't. He's not going to take the time to take care of the symptoms. He wants to take care of the core problem. And so when we have that squeaky wheel, when we become a squeaky wheel, he doesn't want to fix the symptom. He wants to fix what's wrong inside of us. He wants us to think differently. Romans 12, 1 and 2. No longer be conformed to the ways of this world and the thinking of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He wants to transform the way we think. Because if we transform the way we think... We're going to speak differently, aren't we? If we transform the thoughts that we have and the thought processes, that's going to change our words. So if we change our thinking and we change our words, that's also going to change our actions. So we change our thinking, we change our words that we use, we change the actions that we take, and what are those three things going to lead to? It's going to impact our life. So that's why Christ calls us to change the way we think because it's going to affect everything else like a chain reaction. So change our thought processes. Change our thinking. Here's another way to think about it. Even in difficult times, we're still blessed by God, aren't we? We woke up this morning and we're still breathing. That's a blessing from God. Even if breathing is painful and hard and difficult, It's still a blessing. And even if you're on death's doorstep and things are grim and things are awful and you just don't see hope in the situation, there's hope because if you go, you're going where? You're going to heaven. That's a blessing. And so think about it this way. Even in difficult times, if we complain, even though God has blessed us a little bit and he's given us something to be thankful for, if we complain about those few blessings, why would he give us more? Why would he give us more? Many of you may be familiar with the parable of the talents. It's in Matthew 25. Jesus tells this story about a rich man. He's about to go on a journey, and so he takes three of his servants, and he gives them very large sums of money and says, take care of this while I'm gone. And so he leaves, and two of those servants go and double the money. They invest it, they use it properly, and they double it. One of the servants takes it, puts it in a Folgers can, and buries it in his backyard. Surprise, they had Folgers back then. No, they didn't. (laughs) He takes it, and he buries it in his backyard. And when the master returns, those two servants come up and say, Master, look what we did. We doubled your money. And the master goes, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you were good with a little, I'm now going to give you a lot. And then the one servant comes up and says, you know, I knew you were a hard guy and you're, you're pretty hard to work for. So I took your money and I put it in a coffee can and I buried it in the backyard to keep it safe. And he looks at the guy and says, you wicked and lazy servant. I gave you a little and you squandered it. Why would I give you more? And so he took the little bit that that servant had, he gave it to the other two, and he kicked the servant out. If God gives you a little, and all you do is complain and squander it, why would he bless you more? Some of you are going through difficult times, and you can't catch a break, because all you do is complain, and you squandered the little bit of blessing that God has given you. And because you squandered it, God's not about to give you more, because what would you do with more? We should always be pointing to him. And when we can't point to him in our difficult times, why would God bless us more? Because he's not. That's not how it works. He wants to take that squeaky wheel and fix it from the inside. So here's how we do that. We recognize what God could be doing. If you're that squeaky wheel and you have a hard time not being squeaky, recognize what God may be doing. And even if you cannot see any light at the end of the tunnel, there's no hope in your situation, you still point to God and you still know because he promised it, something is gonna be good out of this. 
And so you deal with the situation and you try not to squeak because you know God has promised you that it's going to work out for your good. Romans chapter 8. Then, instead of focusing on ourselves, we focus on God and others. If all we do is complain, and the people around us hear us complain constantly, and they're not complaining, what if they're going through a hard time and they're just not telling you? What if their hard time is way worse than yours? And all you're doing is complaining. You've now diminished and minimized their hurt and their pain. And guys, that's an insult. We all go through difficult times. It's how we handle those difficult times that matters. And lastly, you need to believe in his power to provide for you. I just gave you half a dozen passages about promises of his provision and what he's going to do. And so live in those promises and believe that he's going to be true to his word because he will. The whole point of this, according to verse 15, is don't whine, shine. Don't whine about your situation, shine. Verse 15 says this, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are called to be a shining light in the world of darkness that our friends live in. Think about it for a second. Who is the God that we serve? He is all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere. He is perfect in every way, created and sustains the entire universe. And he loves every single one of us in this room so much that he let his one and only son come to this earth, live a horrible life, die a gruesome death on a cross to save us from our ultimate destruction. Because what do we deserve because of our sin? We deserve to go to hell. But he sent his son that through a relationship with him, we don't have to go to hell. We don't get what we deserve. We get what we don't deserve. That's God's love. You see, it's not what we do, it's who we know. It doesn't matter how many good deeds or how much money you give away, you can't get to heaven on your own. You have to have somebody get you in. And that somebody is Jesus Christ. He's the only one who has ever lived, who had the glory and the perfection to die for us and get us into heaven. That's the God we serve. And guys, your friends that don't know him are living in a world of spiritual darkness. My, at my house, my bedroom is completely pitch black. My wife has a hard time sleeping, and so she doesn't want even a single ray of light coming in the doors or the window of our bedroom. And so it's pitch black at night. And if I leave something in the floor, because I'm the one who leaves things in the floor, not my wife. If I leave something in the floor... And I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or something, and I trip over that. Why did I trip over it? It's not because I didn't see it. It's because I couldn't see it. Your friends, your family, your coworkers who do not know Christ are living in that kind of spiritual darkness. And Christ calls us to be the light in their life. And if you're complaining, you're not being a light. And your friends are continuing to live in that spiritual darkness that ultimately leads to destruction, just like me tripping over something in my bedroom and banging my head on a dresser. Guys, we're called to be a shining light in a world of darkness. So shine, don't whine, shine. So what are you saying and doing to shine his light in the lives of the people around you? Are you the squeaky wheel on a shopping cart? Are you the messed up muffler on a 74 GMC pickup? What does your life sound like? What does your life sound like to the people around you? Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this time and for this opportunity. We thank you for this passage. 
And Lord, our desire, our prayer this morning is that you would show us, that you would teach us, that you would impact our lives so that we can go out and be that shining light in the dark lives of the people that we're around. Help us to shine a ray of Jesus in the lives of those we live with day in and day out. God, help us to make the sound of something pleasant, not through complaining, but through living in thankfulness and joy for the Savior that has loved us so much. So Lord, help us to point people to your Son by the way we speak and the way we live. Help us to not wine, but to shine. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our amazing Savior. Amen. Join us in worship.